Hi, I'm Tim and this is my first YouTube video. It's a build video of a room divider I made for my wife for Mother's Day and for the Rockler Plywood Challenge. I started this project as I do all projects, roughing out ideas in Illustrator, looking at shape and proportion and design direction. I considered a mid-century modern approach but decided on something pretty straightforward. I wanted a three-panel design, one that would be functional and complement its surroundings. In this case, our living room, which, although it has a piano from the 1950s, it really isn't decorated mid-century modern, at least not yet. So, I began the build by rough cutting the three-quarter inch Baltic birch plywood into manageable sizes with a circular saw. I made a rough cut close to the midpoint of the plywood sheet between the finish cuts. I made two additional rough cuts about an inch away from the final lengths. This made the pieces much more manageable on the table saw. Before I started this project, I gave a lot of thought to assembly. I wanted a fabric backing for the room divider, but was unsure how best to secure it. I considered stapling the fabric and covering the staples with a piece of trim, but more about that later. I realized pretty quickly that I needed to clean my saw blade, but instead of cleaning it, I scored each piece with a razor blade and made the cuts. Each panel has 11 pieces of plywood cut to width on the table saw, but you could use a track saw or a circular saw with a straight edge. I began the cuts with the legs, moving from the table saw over to the miter saw to cut them to the length. I made this room divider larger than most with legs measuring 82 inches long. That makes for a tall divider, but since the room divider would be positioned close to a stairway when in use, it needed to completely cover the doorway to provide privacy. If I had not made it this tall, anyone going up the stairs would be able to see over it. I saved all of the offcuts from cutting the six legs to length. I would use them later in the build. I moved next to the top and base pieces, which share the same dimensions and are attached to the legs with pocket screws. The top and base are 22 and a quarter inches long by 2 and 3 quarter inches wide. That's slightly smaller than the width of the legs, which were 3 inches wide. The top, base, and legs combine to form the outer frame of each panel. This outer frame is wider than the remaining stretchers, both for aesthetics and to accommodate the securing the fabric. I'll have a set of plans on my website in the coming months. I next move on to cutting the remaining stretchers to length. In total, there are 27 of these crossbars, each with four pocket screws, two on each end. I think it's here that I will mention that using hardwood will greatly reduce the amount of effort to create this room divider as there is a considerable amount of edge banding to do. Initially, I planned this project using hardwood, but as this was part of the plywood challenge, I chose plywood. After cutting the legs and all the crossbars, I set up a stop block and cut spacers for a test layout. Having created the design in Illustrator at actual size, I could reference it if needed. That made it easy to determine what length to cut the spacers. I really need to invest in some longer clamps, but linking these together, these work fine. Basically, all I needed to do at this point was to test my placement. Everything fit nicely, so onto the pocket holes and these offcut pieces I had saved. Using the offcuts and a couple of scrap pieces, I made two pocket hole jigs for drilling the crossbars. The larger jig for the top and base crossbars, the smaller jig for the remaining stretchers. The important thing to remember when drilling these pocket holes is that you want to examine each piece for defects and leave your best side facing out. The side with the defects, the knots, patches, etc., except the pocket holes. These defects will all be hidden by the fabric in the end, along with almost all of the pocket screws. Using these jigs made everything uniform. A jig for a jig, I suppose, but boy did these help as the Craig Mini Jig isn't set up for repeatable operations. I made the back side of these jigs lower than the sides, allowing room for the clamp. Once one hole was drilled, I swapped position of the wedge block and the Craig Mini, then clamped and drilled. My homemade jigs made the hole positions uniform and quickly repeatable. I'm not showing it here, but I sanded all the pocket holes lightly so there would be nothing to snag the fabric when it was applied. For each panel of the room divider, you have 9 pieces which need pocket holes drilled. That's 36 pocket holes per panel, or 108 pocket holes total. With the pocket holes drilled, I started the preparation for securing the fabric to the panels. I routed an 8 inch channel on the top, base, and legs to accept the fabric, which would be held in place and tensioned with screen spline just like a screen door. 
I positioned the channels or grooves to avoid the pocket holes in the top and base crossbars, cleaning out the sawdust on each piece and lightly sanding the channel. These horizontal grooves from the top and base will extend into the legs and turn 90 degrees running vertically. This makes a continuous channel to accept the fabric. I'm showing a photo here of a little bit further in the process. At this point, I needed to give these 90 degree dados, grooves, channels, whatever, some thought. So to give me time to think, I moved on to the long, long process of edge banding. There are a number of good edge banding videos on YouTube. I'm not covering edge banding in depth here except to say, use hardwood, and you can avoid the need to hide the plywood edges entirely. As you can see, I did not edge band the top and bottom of the legs. No reason to, really. I'm six foot two and I can't see the top of the room divider. But it was probably a good thing that there were so many pieces to edge band. It gave me time to plan out these 90 degree channels for the left and right legs. With the channels routed in the top and base crossbars, I once again laid out all of the pieces for a dry fit and clamped the panel in place. I then transferred the horizontal extension of the channel into the legs. After marking these positions on the legs, I transferred the outermost mark to the other side of the legs. With the marks transferred to the front of the room divider, I set up a stop block as a starting point for the plunge cut into the leg. I wanted the bit to engage the wood to the inside of my transfer marks. I pushed the leg onto the router table and turned off the router. I then placed a block to mark my start and stop point, removed the first stop block and began routing the vertical channel. You're looking at the front of the leg and this is the left leg. Because you have to pass the wood against the bit in the proper direction, your left leg and right leg will have different starting points for the initial plunge for the vertical cut. So, as you see here, the stop block for the right leg is positioned further from the bit to allow for the additional length of the feet. It's important to remember I have three left legs and three right legs in this build because this is a three panel design. It would be easier if the channels for all six legs were routed the same way, but they aren't, and this is really the only tricky part of this build. The next step is to connect these vertical channels to the top and base channels routed earlier. I found the easiest way to do this was using my Dremel tool. I don't suggest completing this 90 degree turn on the router table. There are several reasons why, but it comes down to safety and control. Trying to do this on the router table means you have six feet of stock hanging off your table. Hard to control. So, I suggest giving yourself more control and erring on the side of safety, clamping the legs to the workbench and using a straight edge as a guide. I did notice that the cut didn't feel right initially. That's because I wasn't moving the bit in the right direction. I stopped, corrected my mistake, and routed the remaining 90 degree turns correctly. I made the Dremel cuts in several passes. There are 108 pocket hole screws for this project. Because there are so many and because this project will never be carrying any weight beyond its own, I chose a no glue approach, pocket screws only. It makes the build simpler and it's a very sturdy project without the glue. I do suggest you sand every pocket hole to remove any burrs that might catch or pick the fabric when you go to apply it, but a no glue approach simplifies this build. Here you can see the 90 degree channels in the legs and how they connect to the top crossbar. The spacers really came in handy during the pocket screw assembly. I can't tell you how excited I was at this stage. I was so happy that everything had progressed so smoothly. I guess 150 feet of edge banding gives you plenty of time to think and to get it right. With the three panels assembled, I moved on to the stain. I chose a dark stain that matches our 1950s piano with no top coat. Yes, no varnish or lacquer. This was totally an experiment on my part, choosing to omit a top coat. So far, I'm happy with the decision and the room divider goes well with the aged finish of our piano. I didn't bother staining the areas covered by fabric, but I did go over the pocket holes with sandpaper a second time. I also chamfered the feet to reduce any chipping, especially at the edge banding. The fabric I purchased is very durable and measures 54 inches wide, so I cut it down to roughly fit the panels. I am very lucky to have a store locally that carries a great selection of commercial remnants, and they have always made finding what I need a snap. The size and number of panels of the room divider you choose to make, along with the width of, the of your fabric, will dictate how much fabric you actually need. I needed five and a half yards. There are several sizes of the screen spline to choose from, and you will need a spline rolling tool. The 1.25 inch screen spline worked best for my needs given the thickness of the fabric. 
you first want to use the convex roller of the spline rolling tool to push the fabric into the channel, then switch over to the concave wheel to secure the spline. The fabric tensions as you insert the spline into the channel. I ran the rolling tool back over the spline a second time after the entire channel is filled. The second pass pushed the spline a bit deeper and tensioned the fabric a bit tighter. The safest course is to do a trial run with your fabric testing different spline sizes for the best fit. The excess fabric can now be trimmed off leaving a pretty clean edge. I used a single sided razor blade to trim the excess pushing the blade through the fabric and into the wood along the routed channels. Be careful not to cut your spline and be sure you are cutting the fabric excess only. Once you get the three panels covered in fabric and tension, you are nearly done. It's just a matter of adding the hardware that connects the panels. These double action hinges were a breeze to install and they allow the panels to swing either direction. I suggest pre-drilling the holes, but no mortises are required. I suppose if you mortise the hinges, it would close up the gap between the panels, but I didn't want to disturb the edge banding. I think I probably would have mortised the hinges had I used hardwood instead of plywood. In the end, four pocket holes show on each panel and I'm fine with that. In fact, I think it adds structural interest. You could always add a trim piece over the spline if you like, but I will probably leave ours just as is. So I set up the room divider outside for these photos and I was glad that it didn't blow over while I stepped away to take the pictures. Then I moved the room divider inside. That's the build video for the room divider. It was a fun project and I learned a lot while making it. Thank you to the guys at Modern Maker for the Rockler Plywood Challenge. Without your motivation, I would not have videotaped this process. I would have simply made the project. I would not have started a YouTube channel, so thank you. Uh, if you're making the project to the dimensions that I made it, know that it's massive, it's really big, and it does not fit in a closet. But if you have a dedicated space for it like we do, then you're good to go. So I highly encourage you to go make that room divider. If you like this video, please subscribe or like or both. And I look forward to seeing you in an upcoming video. So once again, go make that room divider.